Well, let's get right to it. <laughs> you, you're, uh, you're obviously, Nancy is one of America's really most dynamic television executives, and so she's right in the middle of what is now a gigantic change that's going on, and, and I, I wonder what that does to your uh, daily life. <laughs> Do, when you, what's the first... Do you really you, want to talk about that? Well, I, I'm wondering, uh, you go into the office every day, and... Uh, like, what's the first thing on your mind? I actually tried one day last week not going into the office. <laughs> um, and it worked. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's a, a lot of jokes amongst my peers that, you know, timing is everything. Um, and my, uh, my timing and John Martin's timing is uh, unique. I mean, it's, it's, I think it can be highly distracting. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me as a leader is to weed out what is fact and what is speculation and what is just fiction, mm -hmm. um, with everyone being <clears throat> able to access a platform to publish their views, to publish an article, to publish a headline. Anyone can basically say anything now, um, whether or not <clears throat> it holds any merit. And that can be really destructive and confusing and distracting for uh, not only a company, but more importantly, really a creative team. And so I think one of my jobs is to, you know, empower, shield, support, protect, all of those words, you know, the core programming and marketing teams on the building, in the building, which the rest of us feed off of, because without them, we don't have a business. But is there, like, something you want to know every day as soon as you get to your desk, some piece of information you want right away? Um, well, I want my coffee right away. Right. Besides um, that, you know, no, I, I would say it, ch it changes too too much. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I can't say that there's one theme any day. I mean, there could be a week where I'm just with Sean on international, and it, inevitably, whenever I'm focused on one thing, somebody else on you know four there's floors away else, needs me. Yes. Yeah. Why did you pay attention to him today? I need you. Um, you know, but I, I would say first and foremost, measurement is probably the biggest stress. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not accurate. Right. And some of the data that we're seeing, um, you know, that we're not able to talk about, but that we're accessing through uh, whether it be SVOD partners or whether it be our own TV everywhere in front of the wall and behind the wall, um, it's really troublesome. I, I don't have as much of a concern over... Um, technology enabling consumers to watch anything anywhere, nor do I have the platform. I mean, I think that's going to happen, and we can't control that, and the consumer is in charge, and you, you, know, you need to put them at the center of the equation. The one underreported, I think, topic is the um, commercial aversion that is creating. And, right. you know, most of the industry is 50% or more dependent on, on advertising. advertising. Yeah. And, and that's, th those dots aren't getting connected enough, I think, in the conversation. Do you have conversations with advertisers now? Because one of the things I yes. find interesting is that they, they are at sea as well. Yes, they, I, yeah, I find that the clients really want to engage and deal with us directly. And, um, you know, and the agencies are struggling with figuring out how to either support that or allow that. You know, the, the clients are seeing it. I mean, many clients are also self-publishing their own marketing now, and they're, they're starting to engage in digital platforms differently. They're engaging with their consumers, whether it be a driver of their car or a user of their toothpaste or a buyer of their insurance. They understand that there is a relationship that engages, and I think that they're starting to see there are different ways that we can use this medium of television, but the entire infrastructure is still based on a reach and frequency spots and dots. Right. And, and that's got to change. It has to change. And it's going to take one really bold advertiser and one really bold CEO to say, all right, let's go for it. it. And no commercials on this night, and or, here's what it's going to look like. Or something different, or why not commercials that are 10 seconds long, well, or... Or well, one of my favorite of the stats screen, is or the, the the commercials just need to be better. The, the yeah. YouTube posts the most viewed commercials in a week or in a month, and um, I some people may have heard me say this, but what do you think the longest spot is on YouTube? The duration of the longest spot. I have no idea. It's two minutes. They have a two minute spot. The number one spot is two minutes long. But it's just really good. It's, it's really good. It's good content. That's, that's yes. Yeah. Have you watched Dear Kitten? 
No. It's really good. <laughs> it's like that could be a show. <laughs> Contact the creators there. Um, well, do you think A and E is well positioned in given this maelstrom you're in the middle of? Yeah, I mean, I do. I think that we're working through a transition. And we're working through a transition of how we're going to be viewed, how we're going to be paid to be viewed, you know, where we're going to be viewed, and and as the industry, you know, historically has gone through these massive platform transitions and distribution transitions, it's taken a little while. But what has prevailed is, you know, those who have strong brands, those who own their content, which we always have pr predominantly, um, and, and those who um, are content producers at heart. And I think that um, there's long been a debate, you know, is what's the most important? Is it the distribution pipe? Is it the, you know, the advertising dollars? Is it the content? Well, I think everyone's discovering that it's the proximity to the content, you know, and, and how you engage with it. And that and the fan base that is loyal to that content mm -hmm. is really critical. So I think we're moving not only away, not only are we changing, you know, platforms and we're changing models, but we're also looking at what does success look like, you know. Do I want two million people who like it or do I want one million people who love it? Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, and that's not because we... two million who love it? Uh, yeah, I'd like two million <laughs> who love it, but it's because of the way that that one million will engage in right. social media and will, you know, user-generated content, the community outreach, the, the sort of advocating on behalf of their own fandom. Right. Well, you have brand, your, your brands like A&E History, well-established, mm -hmm. lifetime... You've done some interesting things with you. Have really a fascinating new show mm -hmm. that is getting a lot of buzz, which I'm it. sure you're happy about. Very right? happy about it. Unreal. Unreal is the show. Um, but, at the, but at the same time, we're looking at things like what's happening within the unscripted world. It's yeah, suddenly I, shifting, <laughs> changing, and falling off in some areas, and maybe because it's just glutted. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's the, the, there's an enormous increase in the amount of hours being produced for all platforms, both scripted and unscripted. Obviously, unscripted is the easier, the lower barrier to entry, so that's seen the most uh, increase in hours. I think we've also, you know, I, I feel like I'm too young, but I guess I'm not to say I grew up in it, and I, I really did, and, and the karma and the approach and the sort of scrappiness and entrepreneurial way that we approached it felt very, very different 10 years ago than it feels now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it used to be we were in it because we wanted people, you know, the holy grail was somebody talking about my show on the subway was the thing that you aspired to, and now it's what's the multiple of cash flow on my company. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's not a problem for entrepreneurs and for business, and that's great if that's the path that you're going on. But getting back to that really passionate, core, guttural, I'm a creative because I love being a creative, yeah. not I'm a creative because I'm going to do 12 times my EBIT and cash in. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had a massive hit with uh, Duck Dynasty, which, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, nobody anticipates those things happening. No. but Sometimes you regret them when you see them coming, like, oh, God. <laughs> we know how this ends. <laughs> <laughs> but can, can it be done again? Of uh, course. I mean, I, you know, I think... It, I believe it will be done again, and it can be done again. You never know when and how it's going to happen. Well, you never know You that. never know. Yeah, Not with those. I mean, you sort of feel the one, you know, you feel the pawn stars. You can see, oh, this is a great show to watch. It's easy. It's accessible. Yeah. It ticks mm -hmm. all the boxes. Everyone loves it. And, and you see the growth, you know, week to week. I think when you have ones that just, you know, accelerate really fast and come out of nowhere, um, and that really end up on the cover of, you know, Us Weekly and People overnight. Those are the ones that are hard to predict. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they will happen. I mean, you, you, I think what we have to hope for is that you end up on the cover of Us Weekly for the right reason. Yeah. Um, well. and, and I think right <laughs> now, <laughs> maybe someone's got to cancel a show. Um, it's not the right reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's all, all that falls in your lap. So. Yeah, I mean, there still has to be integrity behind the decisions that we make, and and that's important. And I and I think we've been 
Um, I'm incredibly proud of the team and how much they've pioneered really pushing the boundary in genres and areas where nobody else has. I mean, we were sort of first in on subtitling reality stars, you know, my proudest moment, great. <laughs> um, but it, it, it actually engaged the viewer and the audience and, and we actually right. talked about that with the, those characters and that talent. Like, are you okay with, of course, we don't understand what each other are saying. I mean, <laughs> they, they, you know, they were very embracing and open about it. But, it, you know, when the fifth show came out, that's not good for the business and it's not good for the consumer. And, you know, we've been on stages like this and everyone on my team's been on stages like this saying it before. And that's really where it comes back and it's, you know, it's the responsibility of the creative community to sort of break through. And it's the responsibility of my team to take a chance on something that hasn't been done. And what I say to them all the time is I would much rather you fail spectacularly than fail sort of eh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, international is really important, obviously. Uh, how much time do you spend on that? How, how do you do, you do you focus on that? You know, is that like half your attention? Is no, it? I wouldn't say that it's it's half. It's a lot. I mean, Sean is a diva for anyone in the room that knows Sean. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, Sean reports directly to me, and that, mm -hmm. and that was a decision, you know, deliberately. And um, I just on my uh, two-year anniversary and I, my second day on the job as CEO, I went to the international conference and um, and that's something my predecessor hadn't spent a lot of time doing. And um, I know that international is a growth area for us and, it's, um, and our brands are, are translating globally. We've um, pivoted our business strategy a little bit from um, under the Nick DeVatsis and then Abby, we built the international business on a JV model and we're slowly looking to sort of bring a lot of those JVs either in operating control or wholly owned as we can. Um, our business is growing double digits. It's, you know, Canada is obviously an incredibly important partner for us, mm -hmm. not only for our brands and with Barb and Shaw Media, but the production that production. we do here. How much production do um, you do here? We're almost about, over the last 18 to 24 months, about 500 hours, is that about mm -hmm. right? 500 hours. 500 hours. A lot. Um, and a lot of post-production um, mm -hmm. as well. So that's physical production. There's, whoops, um, a lot of post-production out of Toronto as well. For because it makes good economic sense, It makes right? good economic sense, mm -hmm. yep, yep. So that is going to continue. You're going to... I don't see any end to that train, no. Mm -hmm. not, n not with the volume of production we need and the restrictions that exist in the States in terms of where credits can and cannot work. Right. So uh, what, what do you think works internationally now? Like, if someone well, I, comes I to you with an idea, what do, you, do you say to yourself, I, this might work, but it's not going to work internationally? Does that pop into your head right away? Mm -mm. No. No, because I do think that, you know, look, more than 80% of my bottom line is still the domestic business. And the strength of the domestic business feeds the international businesses. The stronger the, the domestic brands are, the stronger the international brands will be. Um, the greater content that we're able to reinvest in and reimagine and, and grow our content business, that translates across borders. And, um, you know, we see a lot of shows that you wouldn't think, you know, translate across borders. Work. For example? Um, Ice Road Truckers is one of our number one shows globally. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's... Well, it's a, a great adventure. It's a great adventure, that's but it's a very American show. It it's very American characters. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ancient Aliens is another one. Like, I guess the whole world is obsessed with aliens. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and the yeah. movies work. Obviously, the obvious things work. The scripted works. There's a more global appetite for that programming to cross borders. But mm -hmm. I think there's a misconception that the only thing that can, can travel is, you know, animals. And, and that's just not, we haven't seen that to be the case. Uh -huh. How did Duck Dynasty do uh, internationally? I don't know, how did it, not, not great. It's better than what we did with Mafia. Yeah, but it wasn't distinctive. No, it's not one that yeah. like pops up yeah. on the radar for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, I, I know, is, it, is that generally true? I mean, obviously you, you mentioned- No, Pawn Stars some, worked incredibly well. That's well. what I was gonna ask. That, so that I think, that, but there was a little more of a format and a, um, you know, I felt that always that Pawn Stars was more of a game show for men. Mm-hmm, yeah. Well, you know, with, it's interesting, you have the History Channel, which does extremely well with men. Yes. Right? And, and that's kind of unusual in the television business. Um, you've expanded that brand in very interesting and creative ways, it seems mm -hmm. like. You know, uh, what do you see with that going forward? I mean, do you, 
do you see it being less specific history and no I mean I, I don't see I think that we run the gamut and that's important to remember I mean you know Sons of Liberty and Men Who Built America and America Unearthed and all of these shows that are on now are very core to the roots of what the network has been mm -hmm. Actually, ironically, and, and you know, I'm not sure how many people in the room have actually watched Pawn Stars, but it's probably the show with the most history in it yes. on the network. There's an mm -hmm. enormous amount of history in that mm -hmm. show, and so we get we get dinged from the perception of the title, but if you actually watch the substance of the show, it's it's very cleverly produced, as is American Pickers and um, shows like that. But I think we've, if you think about history, we're in our relative infancy when it comes to scripted programming. We've only been doing scripted programming for two and a half years. Really? And so to have the traction that we've, we've had, had some hits. Yes. we've had some big, big hits mm -hmm. and big shows. And, and I think that presents a real opportunity for us to be that, that very strong voice among all brands. Again, that's an interesting question though. Are you doing history, Americanized history? You know, your big script... Well, our biggest Vikings, script is Vikings, Vikings and is that's not, not Americanized. Vikings is not. Yeah. But, but Hatfields and McCoys was a monster hit. Monster, yeah. And, and I don't... I mean, that's an interesting fact, you know, little fact in American history. Uh, I don't know if the rest of the world has any idea of that, other than maybe the phrase to fight... Yeah, I mean, like you know, Hatfields Kevin helped that cross borders. Oh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Cast, casting, the casting is really important. Casting did that one. It's really important. But... Uh, What's what do you think about the, the impact of SVOD on you? Is I mean it's on everybody, but what yeah. do you, how is it really playing out in your day to day? Are are is it getting harder well, to I get some talent in because they want to do they'd much rather of do? Of course, I mean there's there's competition for talent everywhere. I mean you know cable created the competition for broadcast with talent, and now SVOD is creating competition for cable and for broadcast. And quite honestly, there's a digital drain on a lot of emerging talent too where um, you know, there's the, end of the ends of the spectrum. You can have um, you know, really high profile, creative powerhouses in Hollywood deciding I'm strong enough of my brand to go over the top by myself, or yeah. just even competing for um, you know, the next great, fresh, innovative minds coming out of um, colleges. That's, that tends to be the place that they're, they're attracted to. So there's, there's competition everywhere. I think the you know, the challenge today is really about competing for time and the conundrum that SVOD creates in the distribution ecosystem as well as the advertising is, you know, obviously there's a different viewer behavior, there's advertising avoidance, and there's this phenomenon that we're looking at is it's good enough. And that the content, you know, the brands, they know the brands, but the content that they're getting on different platforms that may be licensed by the other cable and broadcast brands, the audience doesn't, this appointment viewing is really rare. Yeah. Really, really rare. And that I love what history has to offer. I'm okay with watching last year's show. I don't need to watch this year's right. show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you or, know, or we're a smaller player. This year's show sounds in interesting, one. but I can watch it but next year. But I can year. watch it next year. Yeah. And so th that's something that I think we have to all work through and you know we're not going to be a the a game changer in the face of you know can we can we change Netflix's business or Hulu's business no they have their businesses to run and but they're also licensing an enormous amount of product from very big brands and very big entities right. and i think this question is becoming more pervasive you know well, that's what do we do do you, my do, 20, do you sell to them do you, is it is it just recently we we had said you know, no thanks for a long time, mm -hmm. and um, and quite honestly, a lot of the economic pressures this year have have created uh, a need for us to look at the long tail of some of our shows where we don't feel like it's impacting our brand recognition to the original premieres. But it's pretty modest; it's pretty small. We're in comparison to others, right. we're very small. But do you think that all of that is like creating a, this cannibalization factor? Where you're I don't know that it's cannibalizing <clears throat> a specific show. So you can't say the Dance Moms rating is down because someone's watching Dance Moms, you know, to on Hulu years. or wherever. I'm not even sure where it is or on yeah. Amazon. But what's happening is I'm not getting the live viewer because they're using their time right. that way. Right. So that's the bigger, the bigger question. Right, and and that seems to be particularly growing in the demo that you want to sell to yeah. is a, it's sort of yeah. a vicious My, cycle. Our here. top 20 shows <clears throat> are linear across all three big brands and our top 20 shows just out there and the, they don't intersect 
only four of them overlap. Which four? <laughs> uh, Dance Moms, um, I think Pawn Stars, and it's like two other obvious ones. Mm -hmm. Ancient Aliens. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's not even a top 20 show for us, linear though, so that can't be. Yeah. But it's, they don't, the shows that are working in the non-linear aren't even big shows in premiere right now on the linear. So you could say that's additive. So that's, there's some hope. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that could be an exciting opportunity, right. but the monetization model hasn't mm -hmm. evolved yet enough. So it does show a desire to consume, you know, vast quantities of the content that is associated with great brands. Mm -hmm. It's just how the economic model evolves to it. Well, the, you, you're not alone in the sense that all cable channels in, in America are, are challenged now, and everybody's ratings have been affected quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and going forward, it looks like there'll be more pressure to do things like unbundle. Mm -hmm. How's that going to impact everybody's business? Well, I think... You know, look, you have to follow the consumer, and the consumer is in control. I, I think you, it's a, the unbundling, I think, is a stronger word than the reality of what will happen. It will most likely be a rebundling. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, some yeah. portfolios will end up winning, and some portfolios will not. And, yeah, there are, there know, are channels that are going to go away. There are channels that are going to go away, mm -hmm. no question. And our job is to make sure that the three big behemoths that we have, A&E, Lifetime, and History, are in every and any package they can be in. Mm -hmm. And that the three growing but smaller brands, um, FYI, H2, and LMN, are appealing in different ways to that generation that may opt into the skinny packages. Mm -hmm. I, which brings up a Lifetime question, which I think is... You, when you started, I think you said you really had to focus on Lifetime. Oh, yeah. And, and bring it back to life. Yeah. <laughs> so it became She's Lifetime. She's alive. Today. Right. <laughs> um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering conceptually what you thought, how to go about that. Now, I think Unreal is an ideal thing. Yeah, fit, I think it's, you know, you look back and it... it um, there's so much doubt in the community when we start these journeys. Oh, it's dead, and I can't do it. And the <laughs> right. And it's you know it takes a long time to turn around a big network and a big brand. And I think we're uniquely positioned as a company because we've done it with A and E, we did it with History, we did it with Lifetime. We're gonna probably have to do it with A and E again. And mm. um, and and we know we have the patience and the fortitude and the ability to do it. Being a private company probably helps us do it because we don't have to every three ninety days, you know, explain to someone who doesn't understand the creative business why we're investing when mm -hmm. ratings aren't up. Well, right. because there's a lag time and there's production models and you have to invest for the future. Um, you know, so I, th I think we've been, I think we've proven ourselves over and over again in our ability to do that. Um, I could not be more proud of you know, the team at Lifetime and Nina and Rob and um, Eli and Barry and Tana and um, I am always get myself in trouble when I say names because I'm not going to say <laughs> some name that's right. critical, Tim Nolan. Um, but everyone, I mean, they have worked tirelessly in the face of doubters and, and, and also the underdog mentality. And quite honestly, right now, they're our, they're our crown jewel. They're their really? performance is stronger mm -hmm. than the other two big networks. It's doing better than history now. Yeah. That's remarkable. I mean, not in the rankers, but in the growth story right uh -huh. now. That, I mean, history is a much bigger network, but Lifetime right. has moved up in the ranker three or four spots in all the key demos. And it's, okay, but it's still defined as a network with a women's approach, women's yeah. appeal, right? Yeah, but I think so what appeals to women today, I mean, the number one show for women in television right now is Walking Dead. Uh-huh. Doesn't seem like that's a you guys show, putting us down again. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I mean, I had to go into a boardroom and explain why I didn't think wedding shows and makeover shows were appropriate. Were, were, you didn't think they were appropriate, okay? And and how did that go over? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you so? Well, that uh, it brings up the obvious question: as a maybe the most prominent woman executive in the business, you have a unique perspective. Mm -hmm. that, and you notice the difference when you sit and talk with other male executives? Yeah, 
Uh, about lifetime or about in but general? Just in general. <laughs> well, obviously about lifetime. Well, that's for the noon panel. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I definitely see a difference. There's a. Um, Barb and I have had a lot of conversations about this in the last 24 hours, but um, there's, there's style differences, there's points of view differences. I've never, I mean, the elephant in the room is a man is at the helm of lifetime, um, Rob now. but I always said, well, I was a woman at the helm of history. I mean, I think that that's stereotyping people as only capable of doing a job that maybe matches their physical appearance doesn't make any sense either. Right. So, you know... I, it wouldn't make sense to have an eight-year-old in charge of Nickelodeon, for example. No. <laughs> so it can, it, you, you can cross over, yes, I think, yes. in, in, in your interests. So um, we're talking a lot about change. You must be questioned about this all the time, but I'm wondering how... Do you think about... Spend time thinking about tomorrow at all, or is it only about today? You're, oh, no, I would say 50% of my time is about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it going to look like? I mean, the, the frustrating cycle of that is we just don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it can be a, a, a time suck. Um, and that, you know, I'm a producer at heart, so I want to I wanna control things and build things and put them in their, you know, in their right order and their right sequence. And um, when you're dealing with the macroeconomic shifts of our business, that's harder to do. And so I have to be careful that I don't, you know, set a path that's so rigid that, you yeah. know, I'm, I mm -hmm. can't produce to what distribution is going to look like in five years. Yeah, but but you do have to. There's constant change going on. Every constant day, change, but so. I think how I manage that is that, that I have I create a culture that's adaptive, not tactical, and not reactive. Mm -hmm. And so all of my time is focused on are are my, you know. We call it at A&E Networks the comfort of discomfort, and do I have? Uh, and that isn't necessarily what we needed five years ago or four years ago. But today, do I have a management team that's okay with being uncomfortable and changing all the time? And that's exhausting. And you know, stamina is something that we t are talking about more seriously. And how to how do we? sort of build that in mm -hmm. to our everyday culture. Mm -hmm. A lot of meditating going on at a &E Networks <laughs> these days. She said we could meditate. Everyone disappeared. <laughs> Tell us about your deal with Vice. Um, you know, part of the looking for the future is, is being able to learn and diversify our revenue streams. Um, when you look at, you know, what I would call um, brand, publishing brands in the digital world, there are very few true big brands. Um, there are a lot of you know publishers and a lot of creators, but very few brands. Mm -hmm. And Vice is a big brand, and um, and we had an opportunity to come in on an investment basis and learn from them, and and us be able to give them whatever strategic input I can as a member of their board and. Um, and that's really all it is right now. We think it's a real growth opportunity, and it's a way for us to diversify a bit of our revenue and put our capital to work. What do you think they'll do for you? Though? What's the goal? What I think we're learning a lot about branded entertainment, and we're learning a lot about direct-to-client relationships. We're learning a lot about just digital publishing and vertical brands and YouTube. And you know, it, it's still in its early days, so I, you know, be, I can't tell you specifically what we're going to do for each other, but. Mm -hmm. There is a currency back and forth. There are the bigger they get, the more challenging issues they have to deal with, and they have the access to come to us and say, "How do you deal with this S and P thing? How do you deal with you know these kinds of advertiser questions? How do you deal with?" So we're supportive of each other, but know that ten percent is a, is a minority stake, and mm -hmm. and um, and we're competitive, and we're in different businesses. So it, it and we're close to each other, just across the bridge. So you see more of that happening, those kinds of alliances? I, I think uh, that we're looking at ways to diversify. I mean, you know, one, one theory is that the digital brands of today are the cable of tomorrow. And, you know, we were formed by broadcast companies 30 years ago because they saw cable coming and they made investments right. so that they could have what is now their most profitable business, cable. Right. And we're a cable business that's now looking downstream going, what's going to be cable in 25 years? And it's probably going to be digital. Right. And so we better get ready. And that, that's not going to be tomorrow. And that's not going to be three years from now or five years from now, which is very, um, in our instant gratification culture, very unsatisfying because mm -hmm. <laughs> we want it right now. Yeah. But it is going to be downstream. Well, you mentioned that <clears throat> you were started by 
big brook, and they, they're still your your owners, uh, ABC and Hearst, right? Really? Uh, you know, <laughs> it, they don't call you, they don't send you emails. So, we call uh, it Burbank. <laughs> Burbank. Um, how much freedom do you have? Are you completely autonomous? Yeah, I have four uh, board meetings a year, mm -hmm. and um, they're very supportive of our organization. We've our organization's been very fruitful for both companies. Um, and Hearst and Disney have a long legacy of being partners together. Their other very meaningful partnership is ESPN. Um, and so right. they're the, you know, one of the things that you hope for in a great partnership is that the partners get along and the partners are good partners. Otherwise, the JV that's in the middle can really suffer. And that's just not, not even a remote case for us. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're all simpatico and supportive and, um, they've let us, if you look at, you know, one way to sort of say, put the proof to the support is the CE, the three CEOs that this company have had have all been internal. Um, they've large, largely let us make, they, not largely, they have let us make all of the executive decisions that we want to make. Um, they've let us invest in vice. They, they've let us invest in channels and rebrands and international. And I think the greatest sign of support and arm's length is the freedom to do and imagine what we have done as a company for the last decade. Mm -hmm. Well, do you, do you think it's an advantage to have that going forward in a world of rebundling, let's say? I mean... That would be a Disney strategy or a Hearst strategy yeah. that I can't speak to. But it's interesting that... But we're independent. Sort of, we went on Sling independently. Yeah. No, I know you are now. I just, uh, yeah. I just think in some ways it's a hedge against calamity or something. Well, I, I think know. in the in the future, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, the, the ecosystem of the bundle is <clears throat> is a very strong proposition. You know, it, it, a, a, a family of four can't go to a movie on one night of the, of the month for the same price as it costs to get a month's worth of massive amounts of entertainment in your cable or satellite or telco bundle. So there is tremendous value that's there. And, and none of us on either side of the equation are motivated to see that completely unravel and go away. Um, that said, you know, if it does accelerate and if bundles get, that gets more aggressive, the unbundling and rebundling of our ecosystem, clearly it'll look like portfolios right. of channels. Mm -hmm. And I can't speak to what those portfolios will look like. But th that speaks to how important it is to keep your brands really vital. Brands vital. A brand's vitality is probably the most important thing right now, and we got a little bit away from that over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. But you're feeling better about it? I am feeling better about Good. it. Good. We're going to open it up to questions for Nancy, uh, and, and it's a little hard to see people. I can't see you anyway, so you can ask anything. <laughs> but if someone will jump up and ask a question, uh, or are you going to make me ask more? So There's always one. Come yeah. on. Come on. Who, who wants to know something about really big time American cable channels. <laughs> and Canadian. Yeah, and Canadian too. Okay. Well, I guess then I will continue. Uh, I ask this of everybody now. What do you think of the difference between people watching in a binge format and people watching week to week? And, you know, there, there, I think there's an interesting argument to be made that the more people binge, you, you can create a bigger phenomenon with a show that isn't being binged. Yes, I don't think Game of Thrones is being binged because I don't want right. some knucklehead to tell me that. Exactly. You know, when I walk what, into the office. Who was killed the next last day. night? Yes. yes. <laughs> right. Something flew away. Yes. <laughs> well, I haven't seen this episode, so <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're ruining it for me. Uh, but so what, so, what do you feel about that? I mean, do you, do you, I feel do you like binge yourself? I do, you know, I binge. Privately, I don't. I can't get my husband and my family to sit and binge with me. So I think about it, and this is just a personal answer, not an executive answer. That, you know, I'll sit down and watch a show that I love that's very soapy, you know, a couple of episodes in a row. One of the challenges I put out to the teams that oversee scripted programming. I'm, I can't believe I'm saying this because I'm going to give the idea to some competitor. <laughs> but it's time for a two-hour drama. Because if I love my drama, I don't want it to end. Yeah. And so I don't know why no one's doing, it could change the economics, it could change 
so much. And I think that's a great opportunity for us to embrace. I mean, we created the binge behavior in cable television by airing repeats. Right. <laughs> so it's not, you know, you it wasn't Netflix's too. invention. It was yeah. cable's invention mm -hmm. because we had to economically do marathons of programming. Yeah. And if you liked a show, you would stay and you'd watch, you know, five, six episodes of it. And other businesses saw that behavior and understood. Right. Mm -hmm. But don't, I, I just think it's, you know, everybody now talks about Netflix, but there are so many competitors to Netflix. And I think to myself that eventually, uh, you, it seems like they have to bundle. <laughs> they're, they're, Netflix? They're, no, the, the, all the other. I think the entities. next big problem is going to be how consumers and audiences find anything. I mean, it's it's frustrating when you go on and there are just so many options. Yeah. It's, you, you do want some control in your life and some organization. Right. And one thing that's remained constant from you know ten years ago to today is still the bandwidth for channels. It's about 12 to 15, 16 channels that any one person watches. Right. That hasn't reduced and it hasn't increased it's constant and Netflix now occupies one of those and now at fix, yeah. Netflix occupies yeah you mentioned the issue of measurement uh, which I think is more huge problem a problem than ever before <clears throat> and you know I, I've done stories in the past about Nielsen and uh, I've, ne I've it, it, they've never seemed to be more at sea than they are now I mean I, I, I don't see how they can sort of go forward in the same format. Yeah, I mean, this this discussion around when can Netflix, you know, evolve and figure it out. I mean, that, it's been part of our industry. You know, is and Netflix, Netflix not Netflix? Uh, Nielsen, Nielsen yeah. is Nielsen right or wrong? I mean, right. that's been a conversation for a, a decade. You know, what's held it together is that we're all on the same metric and we're all on the same currency. So right. <laughs> it's, there's been and sort so of people a level are afraid playing to change, field. and then people are afraid and to the, change. And the agencies have mostly. Right. driven that mm -hmm. and so but I do think more than ever there's there's an appetite and an acceptance of new car new forms of currency whether it be more targeted measurement um, with the likes of the Rovies of the world or rent track mm -hmm. and um, and the and the operators have data and you know how do we work with them more closely to try and access that in a way that respects privacy um, but it, it's the, the measure the fact that we know that an enormous amount of viewing, I mean, everybody in this room probably watches something on their tablet at one point or another, right. correct? We can't capture that. And, no. th and that's, that's got to get fixed. And all the kids that are watching on their phones, I mean, yeah. that's all they watch on. Yep. And none of that is counted, ever. None of it's counted. Uh, and it, you would think at some point somebody has to find a system that crosses over and does both. Yes. <clears throat> but I, <clears throat> I've always found Nielsen to be not very... Yeah. Driven with all of the investment invention. going into tech and new <clears throat> businesses and startups, it's mind-boggling to me that someone hasn't gone into this. <laughs> no, it does, isn't it? You would think it, uh, some tech genius who figured would this, figure out, this would, out would have the answer for everybody. So but. hopefully, maybe Apple will save us all. <laughs> They're probably thinking about it. All right, anyone with a question? There's one. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, my next board meeting is budget approval. Uh, we're a fiscal September business, so we're, our fiscal year begins October 1st. So we're deep in, um, this will really show my corporate stripes, like LRP, long range planning, and all of that stuff. So we're, that, the next board meeting will all be about, why aren't you growing more? Um, <laughs> and so there'll be that debate. And next week, I'm actually taking the heads of the three, the four, the six, six networks and the heads of programming for each of the six networks away for two days just to sort of get the cobwebs out. Not to say that there's cobwebs in there, but to, you know, reimagine what success looks like, to rethink what's working and what's not working and, and why why do some genres need to be reimagined or abandoned and what about others and how do we do a two hour drama and anyone got any ideas or just, it's very hard for me to get back in the weeds creatively with that group, but it's really important for me, for my livelihood and for them. But it's, it's a balance of when am I in, when am I out because my role changed, but that's what I'm doing next week specifically. And I have to figure out how to be like inspirational and cheerleader and I'm not always very good at that. <laughs> I'm like, why aren't you doing that? <laughs> so. Any other questions? Yep. I can't hear you. 
Sign get away from the mic. Oh, I heard you have a sign in your office. I do have a sign in my office. What does it say? Can you explain that? Um, it says Dare to Win. It's a neon sign. And um, we think some of the ratings challenges at A&E has been if you're, we have these really long hallways, and if you're at the end of the hallway where A&E is, there's a, a, a little thing that gets in the way, and it says Care to Win. <laughs> but the other brands see Dare to Win. So, um, uh, it's actually, there's not a lot to it. I saw it at a gallery, and I loved it, and my husband gave it to me as a present. Um, and so it, it wasn't. It was sold, and I got all upset, and I, you know, whined it, about it, and he went and found it. And but he was a great husband. So it, it, and it went up in the office, and it, it, I think that winning and is, can be scary because you might not win, <laughs> and that's the same as taking risks and failure. And you know, I'm very much about that. Like. You're gonna fail. We're gonna. There's gonna be a lot of things we do that fail. But please, God, fail big and fail fast, and move on to the next. Well, on that note, I'm gonna ask one last question. What is? Give us an idea of, if you can, of a project coming up that you're excited about. Um, Alone is really great. It's a. Uh, it's it's actually shot in Canada. Um, it's on History Channel. I think tomorrow night, tonight, 18th. Okay, mm -hmm. I thought it was the 12th. The and 18th. And it's about. And it's. Um, it's all self-shot, so that's the big risk. Um, literally, we dropped, I think it was a dozen men, 10, 10, oh, I'm already, um, off in the northwest region of Nova Scotia and gave them, they went into sort of boot camp of how to shoot themselves for two weeks. Um, they got a flare gun and we left. And um, it's pretty wild. like. It, you'd think that's boring because they're by themselves and they go to 10 different places, they don't stay together and there's no character to talk to and there's no tension and there's no drama and there's no interplay and you can think of a million reasons why this would not be a good idea. But they have <laughs> Somebody no food, by themselves no, with they, a camera. <clears throat> yeah. They have no, you know, yeah. that's boring and it's not. Mm -hmm. it's, they, it's not, sur you know, obviously survival is a key part of it. Yes. But the theme is really ends up being a lot more mental and what we start saying to ourselves you know, after a really short period of time of isolation. So it's self-reliance. Really. And self-reliance. Yeah. Yeah. And basically the cameras become Wilson in about 42 hours, 40, uh, 42, 72 hours, 48, 72 hours. Is there a game element to it? Last Man Standing wins a half a million bucks. And and the, the, the and they uh, don't know when the others bow out. So you, they, it, they, they have don't to give know up. they're the last one. They so, have to so give, give up. Have to they give. were out there for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's an exciting idea. It's really exciting, and mm -hmm. it's you know I think that reality got you know used to be really raw and really authentic and mm -hmm. scrappy because we didn't have enough money to do it any other way. And then it grew and grew and got overproduced and scripted and manipulated and it became something else. And this is like stripping it all back mm -hmm. to its bare bones. And it's it's great. I really, you know, believe in this show and hopefully it creates some noise for doing something different. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll look forward to that. And thanks to Nancy Thank for you. this great session. Mm -hmm.